Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this month's online lecture for the Society of Army Historical Research. Uh, these talks are becoming more and more popular, and um, part of the reason for us doing it is to, to make the wider world aware of the work of the Society, which looks at the uh, British and Commonwealth armies over the centuries. Uh, last night we had our AGM in the National Army Museum in London, uh, and during that AGM we had a fascinating talk, uh, over an hour, by James Faulkner on the life and times of Marlborough, it seemed to me. Uh, I learnt uh, an awful lot, and that's one of the reasons why I'm a member of the Society, because although I specialise in the warfare of the 20th century, there's so much to be learnt from our experiences over the centuries. Uh, we've publicised this talk widely tonight, um, and I'm glad to say we have nearly 100 people registered, of which 40 are already in the room. And as is normal on these occasions, what I'd like to do is just to speak for a few minutes to give you time to get into the room before our speaker uh, begins. Uh, there are a few housekeeping points that I like to cover as well. So for those that are regular attenders, please forgive me that you've heard this all before. Now, Demio works through your broadband connection. So <clears throat> if you have any problems this evening, uh, loss of audio or loss of video, it will always be down to the strength of your broadband connection. And there are a few immediate action drills that you can take to rectify any problem that might arise. The first is the old fashioned refresh. Now, I know that some people don't know how to refresh a web page. If you look to the top left hand corner of almost any browser, you'll see uh, an incomplete circle with an arrow. If you press that, that will refresh your page. And that will normally sort out any problems that you might be experiencing. If that doesn't work, your second IA drill is to do <clears throat> that famous IT crowd solution, which is to uh, close the browser down and then come back in again. And, and that will, nine times out of 10, solve your problem. But if the first two immediate action drills don't work, then the third and final immediate action drill that you can apply, if you have access to a different browser, is to use a different browser. So you might be watching tonight on Chrome or Safari, but Demio also works on Microsoft Edge and Firefox. So anyway, I hope you don't have any problems this evening. Uh, there is one minor glitch on Demio that sometimes happens, and our speaker this evening has got a number of video clips. And sometimes when a video clip is played and the speaker comes back on, uh, one or two people might experience a loss of audio. And if that happens, as I said, just refresh. Uh, and we always say that no matter whether you attend live this evening or not, uh, you will all get a copy of the recording which will automatically be sent to you tonight and should be in your inboxes by tomorrow morning. Now I'm, I'm looking very briefly at, at um, where people are coming from uh, and we have a wide audience tonight with people from Canada, the United States, South Africa, Ireland, Australia, France and Estonia. So welcome to you all. Um, I put at the start again that we also like you to um, save not save your questions up until the end but to write them as they occur to you during the talk uh, that will save you and me time uh, and when it comes to the Q&A session I will put the questions up on the screen for everyone to read unfortunately for those who are watching the recording uh, you will not see the questions so I will do that annoying thing which is I will read out the question, even though the people in the audience tonight can read it for themselves. So please bear with me. OK, I think that's enough by way of introduction. Um, so our speaker tonight is a retired South African uh, physician who specializes in infectious diseases uh, and has been, um, although now retired and no longer active in his field, is uh, lecturing widely uh, in the UK. He grew up on the battlefields of Natal and now spends most of his time researching the South African War. 
he started this passion as a 15 year old and it sustained him for the last 54 years. Uh, he is shortly to publish a book, uh, The Spion Cop Campaign, which is due out in September. Uh, and it's certainly, I think, one of the books that I would like to have on my bookshelf. So I would like to introduce tonight our speaker, Dr. Robert Davidson. Robert, over to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Dudley. It's a, it's a huge honor to be here. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. And I hope you can all now see. Uh, I've got this book coming out, which is more like an exorcism in that I've been working on this for so long, it's become a kind of ev evil part of myself. But hopefully this will be out in September. But tonight's talk isn't going to be full of uh, facts and figures. I want to really just paint an impressionistic picture of the Spion Cook campaign and try to give you a, a little bit more of a feel for what, what everything was like. Um, I'm going to gallop through it with a lot of pictures and there are a few video clips as well. And I'm delighted to have questions at the end. So when going out to South Africa, the British officer normally carried with him the latest accessories. They were very keen on the C96 Mauser pistol which you see on the left, but even more popular was the Kodak box camera, which had come out in the same year, 1896. And because of the uh, box camera, there are now in existence many hundreds of British officers' photograph albums. This is one of uh, Sergeant Hannon of the Royal Army Medical Corps. And it starts like they all do with sort of pictures of him and his friends relaxing. And then, like they all do, it goes on to something like this, a picture of Spionkop, this most famous picture of the Boer War. And you see he's annotated his, his album there, British Trench Dead. He has another album, this time by Colonel Tucky, also of the Medical Corps. Neither of these men were anywhere near Spionkop or Natal, but they still have exactly the same emphasis in their photo albums. Here he's got two very famous pictures of British dead on Spionkop and another two here. There were six uh, photographs in this series and they were all taken by the man on the right, Jan van Huppen, who was a Dutch photographer. This is a selfie he took with him and his son. And Jan van Huppen toured the Natal front in 1899 and 1900, taking photographs with a tripod camera and he had a very good eye for portrait photography and group photography and then got involved in propaganda photography as well. And largely as a result of those photographs, Spion Cook became so well known that at, at present there are 19 football stadiums which bear the name Spion Cook or the Cook. It was in sharp contrast to the sort of images the public had seen before. This is the sort of fodder they'd had previously. This is a picture by Richard Caton Woodford, Woodville. But when photography became available, particularly photographs like Van Huppen had taken, people clamored to buy them and put them in their albums and they paid over a shilling per picture. When Van Huppen was deported back to Holland in June 1900, the photographs were taken up by other studios and were published under their own uh, trademark. Following the uh, publication of the photographs, there was an outpouring of eyewitness accounts of lurid uh, experiences on Spionkop, of the horrors they'd seen, and everyone sort of wanted to be in on the action. Mahatma Gandhi, who was the head of the Natal Volunteer Indian Ambulance Corps, said that he and his men were in the firing line at Spionkop. In fact, the truth was that they were several kilometers away, and in fact, they were never north of the Tugela. Winston Churchill never minded being, have being referred to the fact that he'd been on Spion Cook twice. He had indeed climbed Spion Cook twice, but he was never on the summit and never saw the fighting actually up close. And then the Boers themselves often uh, claimed to have been at Spion Cook. This is a typical um, Form B where a, a burger applies for the campaign medal. The, this, campaign medal, you had to list the engagements you were in. So this is Burger Edward Wertheim from the Forsberg Commando. On the right, he's put the engagements he's fought in, Elandslacht, Nicholson's Neck, Kalenza, Spionkop, Falkrans, and Peters Heights, where he was captured. 
In fact, we pretty confident he fought a few kilometers away from Spionkov. But it tells us two things. Firstly, everyone wanted to be associated with Spionkov. And secondly, that Spionkov to them meant a campaign of several days, not just a single bloody day on the summit itself. To go back in time for those who aren't familiar with the South African War, um, you can see on this map in pink are the British or pro-British colonies. The Cape Colony on the right is Natal Colony, and then you've got Bechuanaland and Rhodesia. And in green, you've got the two republics, the Boer republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Britain very much wanted these uh, colonies to be part of a confederation, partly because of the imperial project, but partly because the Transvaal had such huge wealth because of the gold mines and had a substantial English speaking population. And the causes of the Boer War are quite well known. When the war broke out on the 11th of October 1899, the Boers took the initiative before British reinforcements could reach the country. And they invaded Natal from the Transvaal in the north and from the Orange Free State to the west. And the commandos met up at Dundee for the Battle of Talana and then converged on Lady Smith, which became besieged from the 2nd of November 1899. People have criticized General Sir George White for allowing himself to be besieged, but it actually was a master stroke because by staying in one place with food, ammunition and water supplies, he could stop the Boers being mobile and they were forced to encircle him. And that tied up 10,000 Boers in Natal for the duration of the siege. Obviously the situation changes entirely when they start to run out of basic provisions or ammunition. And also if once an epidemic started to reach Ladies, no. What I want to do now is to, is to show you a little bit about the Boer Mauser because the, this war was a war of riflemen and this campaign was particularly uh, a rifleman's campaign. So what I want you to notice is the speed of firing of the Boer Mauser and the complete lack of smoke. Lack of so what I hope that clip would show you is that your average boer could shoot 15 to 20 rounds a minute, which meant that a trench of 40 Boers was equivalent to a Vickers machine gun, but more so because these men would wait until they saw a target before firing instead of firing continuously. And they were far, far more accurate than a Vickers machine gun. Even me with my Boer Mauser can put most shots into a postcard at 100 yards, which means you can hit a man most of the time at about 1,000 yards. The ammunition uh, of the Boer Mauser is shown on the left of this picture. It was clip loaded in, in clips of five, seven millimeter, steel jacketed, and it had a velocity of about 2,200 feet per second. And in the middle of this picture, you'll see the 303 Mark II. Very similar, slightly slower, but very similar performance. And on the extreme right of the picture, you see the Martini Henry, black powder loaded, and people, Boers firing Martini Henrys were banned from the trenches because their smoke would give away the position. There weren't enough Boer Mausers to go around. There were 45,000 Boer Mausers for 60,000 burgers. So you'll find Boer Mausers tend to be carved with the burger's name and often with quite elaborate carving so that it wouldn't get swiped. The Boer Mauser at long range had remarkably humane effects on, on the injured. This shows a man who's been shot through the chest. You can see the entrance wound below his left clavicle and his exit wound just medial to his left scapula. And like most chest wounds, he had really no ill effects from it. And these very small entrance and exit wounds at long range healed very rapidly in the South African sun. At short range, that's less than 200 yards, the Mauser was completely different in its effects. The hydraulic shock on the tissues created a huge gaping wound, just as if it 
been struck by uh, Martini Henry. And that's the main reason people began to say that the Boers were using dum-dums, because they couldn't believe that the same bullet would cause a wound like the one in this picture, and these ghastly wounds that are seen at close range. On the battlefield, you'll find mainly ex bullets which are expended at very long ranges. In this, this shows battlefield pickups from the Spionkorp area. The top two rows are 303 bullets, mainly Lee Medford rifles. And you can see they're hardly distorted at all. They've hit the ground at ranges of 1,000 to 2,000 meters. The bottom row shows Boer Mauser bullets, which have also hit the, the ground at long range. The last two in the series obviously have hit a rock and have mushroomed. Then on the right of the picture, you can see two expended Boer Mauser cases, which one finds quite commonly, but one seldom finds live Boer ammunition, whereas there's abundant 303 ammunition all over the Boer War battlefields such as shown in this picture. The Boers were all volunteers and they could participate or not in an engagement if they felt like it. So there were Boers who had been in Natal who didn't participate in any action whatsoever. And there were others who participated in one action after another, whether or not their commando was officially involved. They didn't receive any pay, they elected their officers and um, basically acted independently. Their strength was not in the quality of their rifle, um, but it was in the way they used the rifles. They, they, they fought like hunters in the sense that they kept themselves concealed, they were able to judge distances, and they could take snapshots when the target momentarily appeared. The highest court of appeal or the, 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 the highest military authority was called the Kreisrat or War Council. This was held before each engagement. This is the Kreisrat at Kalenzo, before the Battle of Kalenzo. You see the Boer officers all squatting around to discuss the battle plan. Once they'd agreed and debated the battle plan, they would then disperse to their units and disseminate the instructions. Uh, to the burghers and the burghers would decide if they would participate and what role they would play. But during the battle, no further orders would be given and every man would act as an independent intelligence. This is Burger Roland Schickeling, who wrote an excellent book called Commander Courageous, and he described the, the fact that the Boers would prefer to wait for an attack, but sometimes would go on the offensive unexpectedly. And he described this intense tension when waiting for a British attack, um, when one is consumed by this feeling of anxiety or fear and the, 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 the reluctance to be called a coward keeping you in your place. And he said that at times like this, waiting for a British attack, he could understand why a man might take his own life to be spared of the tension. In Ladysmith, General Sir George White, seen on the left, was gradually watching his, his town become consumed by an epidemic of enteric fever. He'd feared this from the 8th of December in a letter to his wife. He said, if there's an outbreak of enteric fever, we'll be in terrible trouble. And that's exactly what happened. Enteric fever we now call typhoid fever. And a special hospital at Intombi was set up. You see the tents on the right. And by the time Ladysmith was relieved, 550 uh, inhabitants had died of typhoid and 10 and a half thousand had been admitted to this hospital. This shows the uh, cemetery at Ntombi hospital camp. The first attempt to relieve Ladysmith was at Kalenzo and I'll touch on it very briefly. To the left of the railway line, General Hart led his, his unit into a, a loop of the Tugela River. And this shows soon after the battle you see on the left the, the trench in which the Standerton and Ermelo commando men were, were, lie, were waiting. Then on, you see the Tugela River with the crossing place which General Hart had tried to reach and beyond it, the side which was held by the British. The Boers opened fire at about 1,500 yards and within minutes, 216 of the 900 men in the leading battalion were, were casualties. The casualty rate was about 25% within a few minutes. The British said they never saw a Boer the entire day. 
to the right of the railway line, it was the same story. When Colonel Long took his artillery too, too close to the river, he unlimbered about 1,100 yards from the river, and there the Krugersdorp commander opened fire, and within minutes, 105 artillerymen were casualties, and 10 guns were, were captured uh, later that day. This is a picture of the gun sites today. Each of these little square concrete markers is the position of one of the field guns. One of the men who tried to save uh, the, the field, the abandoned field guns was Lieutenant Freddie Roberts, who was the only son of, of Lord Roberts. Um, and he was, he was hit in three places, in his arm, his knee, and through the abdomen, at a range of well over one kilometer. Captain Walter Congreve went out to try and rescue him, carried him back to the shelter of the Donga, um, and Congreve was also hit in three places. So the point I'm trying to make here is that at extremely long ranges, Mauser rifle fire proved, proved lethal, and Buller in his telegram to, um, to London that night said, throughout the day our men did not see a single Boer. This is... Uh, Frederick Treves, the civilian surgeon who went to look after um, Freddie Roberts that night. He found the situation to be hopeless and Freddie Roberts uh, wasn't fit for surgery and he died that night. Treves then went on to write an extraordinarily good book called Tale of the Field Hospital about the fighting at Spionkop on the and the upper Tugela. So the situation after Colenso, Colenso was on the 15th of December, 1899. And the situation is as shown in this map. So at the top of the map, you'll see the town of Ladysmith with the British line in red surrounding it. And then beyond that, you've got an investing line of Boers um, besieging Ladysmith. Coming down from Ladysmith, you'll see the railway line, which the first stop is Colenso, and beyond that, you've got two small stations, Shiverley and Freer. The British held the line up to Shiverley, and they had camps at Shiverley and Freer, and then every day they'd send the armoured train probing north towards Colenso to try to see where the Boers were and what they were up to. The Boers were north of the Tugela River, which you see wiggling from left to right of your of your map and they were entrenched in and around Colenso with occasional outposts upstream that's to the left of the map uh, which we which we call the upper Tugela and also shown on this map you'll see the dotted lines of the wagon tracks which go across country. On the 16th of December after the defeat at, at Colenso uh, General Buddha sent a heliogram to General Sir George White in Lady Smith, suggesting he fires off his ammunition and makes terms with the Boers because he felt he couldn't break through. This became known as the Surrender Telegram and Buller was sacked um, and was replaced by uh, Lord Roberts, who was going to replace him when he set foot in, on South African soil. So for the next few weeks, while Roberts was making his way to South Africa, Buller was determined to rescue his reputation. And the way he chose to do this was to try and move upstream, that's to the left of your map, to try to relieve Ladysmith on the upper together. This is a picture of Lord Roberts, who had no illusions about the difficulty. He said, modern warfare is, is now extremely difficult because of the force of fire of the of the rifles, and it's, it's uh, very difficult to get people, get men to advance in the face of this um, of this force of, of fire. The Boers in their trenches were getting more and more miserable. It was the rainy season. This, the action takes place in the middle of summer, which is the rainy season in Natal, and uh, this, their trenches were becoming distinctly unsanitary, and they were in many letters home expressing their reluctance to carry on, but they did carry on. Then on the 10th of January, Buller's uh, march upstream began. He'd been reinforced by General Warren, who'd arrived from, um, from Britain. And with the reinforcements, the army set off from the two camps of Shiverley and Freer on the map. They met at Pretorius's farm, which is called Pierre on the map. 
and from there they reached the town of Springfield, now called Winterton, um, which they reached that same day. While they were doing this, the Boers were tracking their movements north of the river. You'll see the green arrows moving west as well, and, and reinforcements were starting to leave the, the lines around Ladysmith to match the British progress to the upper Tugela. The garrison in Ladysmith was now so weak that they couldn't undertake any further offensive action, so the Boers felt they could spare men and artillery to move to where the threat uh, was coming from. This photograph shows the first men moving out of camp at Freer. On the left of the screen, you see an ox wagon. This was the main form of heavy transport in South Africa. And then you've got a column of infantry. Um, and the problem was the ox wagons, that they bogged down very easily in, um, in the sort of boggy conditions of the felt. And this, this column moving west only managed uh, to move at one mile an hour. So the Boers had absolutely no trouble keeping up with them north of the river. As well as moving their, um, their men and wheeled um, vehicles west, they also took with them the latest inventions. So here's the, uh, a telephonist or telegrapher. You can see he's using a Morse code key and talking on a handset. The British unspooled wire with them as they went so that they could be in contact from the field with um, Freer and from there with London. And north of the river, the Boers had exactly the same. Their commando headquarters were in contact with Pretoria at all times. On the 16th of January, the troops left Springfield and they headed to Port Kitas Drift. This is marked with PD on your map there on the on the Tugela. And they took with them an observation balloon filled with hydrogen as well as zinc and hydrochloric acid to make more hydrogen. And soon after arriving at Port Heaters Drift, the balloon ascended and Major Phillips in the balloon basket was observing the Boer trenches when he was struck in the head by a Mauser bullet at a range of over 2,000 meters and 250 feet in the air. This was really the last time the balloon had any use on the upper Tugela, because the, the balloon skin was also punctured. General Buller on the hill overlooking Potkita's drift, you can see him in this picture in the distance looking through his telescope, began to be more and more dismayed the more he looked at the Boer lines. Because what he saw was what's shown in this uh, sketch map by Lieutenant Harvey of the Medical Corps. You can see in this Lieutenant Harvey's drawn the Tugela River in, in blue, wiggling around. And then across the Tugela River, you can see the dotted black horizontal curved lines of Boer trenches. There's line after line of Boer trenches. And the more Buller looked through his telescope, the more dismayed he became at the prospect of trying to cross these um, these defences, and he said that the position was even worse than it had been at Calenzo, and he was absolutely correct. It was a very, very strongly defended position. This is a picture from the Boer side of the same position. In the background, you'll see the eastern Twin Peak, and there's a Boer looking through his binoculars, and behind the Boer, obliquely to the right, you'll see a slit trench. There were eight kilometres of trenches like this, and layer after layer of them reaching down towards the river. So Buller decided to keep the majority of the forces upstream of where he was, and they would cross a Trichard strip here on this map, it's shown as TD. And he put these forces under the, under the uh, control of General Warren. These were about 16,000 infantry, 5,000 horse, and about 500 or 600 wheeled vehicles. They were going to cross the river on pontoons. These pontoons had, were, had been fabricated in England, brought out to Durban by sea, and brought up to the front line by railway and then by ox wagon. Unopposed, the engineers put the pontoon bridges across the Tugela in two places, and within a very short time, the pontoon bridges were complete and men and, and um, 
vehicles began crossing. Many of the officers wondered why they had not been opposed, but it soon became apparent to them that the Boer tactic was to draw them on till they were within rifle range of their prepared positions. One of the main obstacles the British faced was the lack of a map. General Buller had found there was no map of Natal, so when in Peter Maritzburg, he'd had a map compiled from the farm boundary maps which existed. And he was very proud of this map, which was reproduced by Blueprint, and it was called the Blue Map. But if you look at the details of the Blue Map, you'll find that it's really a useless bit of paper. It's got the Tugela River, which is fine if you can look at the Tugela River from above, but in fact, the Tugela River is in quite steep banks, and even a short distance away, you lose sight of it. It doesn't show anything useful in terms of uh, landmarks. You can see sort of artists' impressions of the of the high ground, but they're absolutely inaccurate. And the two uh, landmarks which are marked here, Spionkop, that's two and a half kilometers away from its true position. And if you look to the right of the map, you see Falkrantz, that's four and a half kilometers in the wrong place. So this map was worse than useless. Later, Buller defended the map, saying it was good enough to fight by but nobody that I've read seems to have agreed with him. So the British were effectively completely lost. Uh, all the local guides had gone into Ladysmith for protection and there was no one around to actually tell them the lie of the land. The opposite number on the Boer side was General Louis Boerter and from the 18th of January, he was, he was the commander on the, on the Natal front. He was only age 37. He had no military training, though he did have experience in battle. And um, he was an extremely popular and charismatic leader. And once he'd been appointed in command, the morale on the Boer lines was hugely enhanced. He'd been under continuous stress since the Battle of Talana uh, on the 30th of October and had repeatedly asked Pretoria whether he could go back for some leave. And I think in this photograph, you can, you can sort of get a sense of the tension and exhaustion in his face. So the Pontian Bridge was being, was being erected on the 17th of January and Lord Dundonald, who commanded the Mounted Brigade, decided to wade across before the river was, before the pontoon was complete. And he took his two and a half thousand mounted men across the Tugela River with the loss of one man drowned. He then set up his camp while the army was still crossing. So in this map, you see wiggling across the bottom, the Tugela River. This is now the upper Tugela. And you'll see General Warren and the second brigade guarding the crossing of Trickard's Drift while the fifth brigade and 11th brigade have taken up their camps on copies across the river. Lord Dundonald and the Mounted Brigade have gone off to the west and camped there, and they've across a body of water called Fentus Sprayed. And then to the upper and right-hand part of the map, you'll see a large area of high ground called Tabanyama, or I put TY on this map. And this was in Boer hands, and there were outposts on the, on the uh, southern crest of Tabanyama, um, observing everything that was happening below. On the 18th of January, uh, Duncan Mackenzie, who was with the Natal Carboneers, he was a, a, one of Dundonald's commanders, spotted a large force of Boers moving along the road to the Orange Free State. So on this map, you'll see a green stripe extending from behind Tabanyama to the left. As this commander of about 300 Boers was making its way along the road, their intentions aren't known even to this day, but they were undoubtedly going to try and attack the British from the flank. But Duncan Mackenzie uh, got permission to gallop uh, to try and ambush these men, and this became known as the ambush at Acton Holmes. This picture from uh, with the flag to Pretoria accurately shows the Natal Carboneers lying in wait for the Boer commando as they come on, but it's completely wrong as regards the terrain, as I'll show you. It looks like it's in very mountainous, craggy terrain. 
The ambush was a complete success. The British managed to capture 24 Boer prisoners and, and killed eight Boers, but the most of the 300 strong commando managed to gallop back along the road they'd come and back, back to safety. This picture shows Boer prisoners being marched through the British camp at Springfield. But the Times um, history of the war sh shows this action having taken place where, where I put a red circle around in the top left hand corner on the Acton Holmes Road. And if you believe this to be the case, this means that General Warren should have followed up this, uh, this brilliant move by Dan Donald and then would have quickly gone behind Tabanyama and on the way to Ladysmith without further ado. The problem is the actual battle took place seven kilometers away in the opposite direction. And this is something I've been able to establish from an, a number of sources, including archaeology on the battlefield. This is what the battlefield actually looked like. The Imperial Light Horse and Natal Carboneers took up positions on the low copies. You'll see ILH and NC at the bottom of your map. Towards them comes uh, Commandant Opperman from the Pretoria Commando, this dotted line coming down towards the ambush. In the distance, you'll see a Boer artillery gun is indicated. And AH is Acton Holmes Farm and PT is called Peachtree Farm. In fact, this engagement took place on Peachtree Farm, not Acton Holmes Farm. It's, it's well described by Winston Churchill, who was present at, at this action. The, the Boers that uh, were wounded or managed to make a stand uh, took their stand on a little knoll to the right of the road. You can see on this map, I put the word knoll there. This is the knoll upon which uh, Feltkonet, Nicholas Mentz, and a whole bunch of his burghers uh, made their last stand until they ran out of ammunition. Mens was, was killed in the action and he was taken back to the Orange Free State lines outside Ladysmith and was buried there. And this picture's of interest. He was disinterred and reinterred at the Burger Monument in 1978. On the left, you will see they're removing corrugated iron from the grave. And it's of interest that uh, Boer burials were buried under iron to prevent uh, burrowing animals from, from digging them up. The other thing of interest is that his gravestone on the right shows he was in Gefecht to Spionkop. He died in the Battle of Spionkop, Natal, 18th of January. In fact, he was many kilometers away from Spionkop itself and six days earlier. But this goes to show that to them, Spionkop was a, an entire engagement, not just a single battle in a single place. So by the evening of the 18th of January, this is the situation. You have the infantry to the right of your screen um, and the mounted brigade way over to the left. And people have criticized Warren for not moving to the left and joining Dundonald, but in fact, he did try exactly that. On the evening of the 18th, this is a picture of Warren inspecting Fentisbrote and telling the engineers where to try and build a little bridge. And on the 19th, the entire army tried to move westwards to meet up with Dundonald, but the, it was such hard going, there was no um, prepared road. All of the ox wagons got bogged down. And by the end of the day, the furthest they've got is three miles. And they turned around and went back and said, there's absolutely no alternative, but a frontal attack on the high ground of Tabanyama in front of us. This shows the Royal Lancasters crisscrossing Fentus Sprite with this futile day of marching west and then back again. On the night of the 19th, uh, Warren has this council of war that shows Warren with his, uh, his officers. He didn't invite Dundonald to the council of war, being at this stage absolutely furious with him for having tried to drag them all off to the west. I'm going to show another video clip now. And this is a panorama of Tabanyama from um, Fairview Farm. So this is the, what was visible to the British when they planned the attack on, on Tabanyama. So on this map, this is now a satellite view of Tabanyama itself. Um, 
to try and make sense of the map, the West Yorks labeled the spurs or the high ground running down from right to left spurs, numbers one, two, three, four, five. You'll see, see those there. The only uh, hill which seemed to have a name is called Bastin Hill on the left, though it was also called Child's Hill and Conical Hill. The problem with not having any of these features on the map or having any grid, ref grid references is that multiple names were given to the same hill and the same name was given to multiple hills and nobody knew what they were talking about when they referred to a particular feature. But this attack was to start under General Woodgate from the right and the, the first attack would happen well before dawn. So in the dark, the Royal Lancasters, the S South Lancashires and the Connaught Rangers took three pro prominent hills called Three Tree Hill, Pickett Hill and Connaught Hill. This was unopposed because the, British, the Boers had fallen back to their prepared positions, which you'll see higher up on Tabanyama. As soon as it got light, about 4.30 in the morning, the Royal Field Artillery came into action on the road. If I go back to this slide, you'll see the dotted black line is the road to Ladysmith. This is called the Fairview Rosalie Road. And this was the road that uh, Warren had to capture if he wanted to take his, his uh, force into Ladysmith. As I said, this is the seventh battery of the Royal Field Artillery in action on that road on the 20th of January. This shows the same view today. You'll see the skyline is the same, Conical Hill and Green Hill, and the Fairview Rosalie Road is still in use today as a farm track. The Royal Field Artillery then took over Three Tree Hill as its main artillery position. Uh, three batteries are on Three Tree Hill and three batteries in the maize field just uh, east of it. And today you you can still see the Royal Field Artillery gun positions. The foundations of their epaulments are still present. I've painted a white stone on each one of them, them so that they, they can be visited and preserved. The sort of signature that it's a field gun position is the finding of uh, this thing, which is called a T-friction tube, which is the, which is the ignition mechanism for... Uh, for the charge of the 15 pounder uh, field gun. So Three Tree Hill became a, a big artillery position with six batteries of Royal Field Artillery on and around it. This photograph shows uh, officers of the field artillery at the southern end of Three Tree Hill. And in the background, you can see Spur One and, and a limber of ammunition being brought up to Three Tree Hill and the skyline is made up of Spionkop itself. The, um, the horses and the uh, field kitchens were set up in a ravine called uh, Battle Sprite, about 500 meters uh, uh, west of, of Three Tree Hill. This, this shows Battle Sprite in the background of Three Tree Hill behind it. Once Three Tree Hill had been captured, the artillery came into action and bombarded what they thought was the Boer line. And after they'd been doing that for about three hours, General Hart then took his infantry up spur two, uh, starting with two borrowed um, battalions, the Lancashire Fusiliers and the York and Lancaster. Um, this was very, very hard going because as soon as they came into uh, sight of the skyline, they were then within Boer Mauser range. They were then within 2000 meters of the trenches and came under continuous fire from that point onwards and started to take heavy casualties. This is uh, an officer's brownie box picture showing the border regiment in action. Uh, it, it was captained on Spionkop, but in fact it's, it's on Tabanyama. You see the men have removed their foreign service helmets to be able to use their rifles. The peak in, comes down very low in front and makes it difficult to use your rifle if you're actually wearing your helmet. On the crest of the hill, the Boers for days had been digging trenches, and this shows um, the Boers digging a trench using African labor as ne and their own labor and using uh, crowbars to maneuver the boulders into place. This shows soon after the battle in the foreground, uh, one of the defensive walls of a Boer trench, and this shows the same scene today. These trenches are evident over the course of about eight kilometers stretching from Spionkop over, over Tabanyama and then on the other side of Spionkop 
stretching about eight kilometers to Falkland. So an incredible amount of digging was done. Uh, General Butter said that his secret weapon was the spade. Each burger was meant to dig three meters of trench. That's one and a half meters for himself, one and a half meters for someone else, but they generally exceeded that. This is what the trenches looked like. They were neck deep, they were narrow, um, and if you crouched down, they were um, safe against uh, shrapnel, which would come down at an angle of about 45 degrees. On the reverse slope of Tabanyama, they dug shelter trenches, just like the British would only have one company in the firing line and seven or so companies sheltering behind the, on the slope, the Boers would have a, a representation of men in the fight, fighting trench, and then the rest would be in these shelter trenches, which you'll still see today, dug into the back slope of Tabanyama. This one's got uh, sandbags on the roof to protect against stray, uh, stray projectiles, but in general, they are under the trajectory of uh, shrapnel or of spent bullets. So a safe place to uh, get, get some rest and try to eat something. As well as having their, their infantry, about 1,800 burghers in position, the Boers now started to bring in artillery, which they brought up from, from ladies. So this is a picture of Lieutenant Heinrich Brothaus, uh, standing just in front of his uh, 75 millimeter Krupp field gun. And you'll notice that in front of the field gun, they've spread a tarpaulin over the defensive wall. And this is to prevent it, a cloud of dust from flying up when the, when the gun is shot. The Boer guns were completely concealed. They fired smokeless powder. They were never seen by the British at any time. And their fire was directed by forward artillery observers who used heliographs. There were one or two heliographers per gun and the guns were used singly rather than in batteries. As well as bringing up uh, field guns, they also brought up two pom-poms. This is the 30, 37 millimeter uh, Vickers Maxim pom-pom which fires um, what look like, looks like an enormous machine gun uh, belt of cartridges. You can see draped over this man's shoulder on the right. So I'm going to show a final video clip. And this, this shows the, the skyline is the Boer entrenchment. And I want you to notice the complete lack of cover when trying to advance towards it. At the time of the war, there were no trees whatsoever on this landscape. It was entirely grass. So much so that Three Tree Hill was called that because it had three trees. Um, and so you'll have to try and understand that this was a completely barren, grassy plateau that the British would have to cross. So by about midday on the 20th of January, the British had taken the positions shown in triangles on the right, and Dundonald and his uh, mounted brigade had been asked to move back towards the infantry from their position on the Acton Holmes. They saw the opportunity to, to help by taking Bastion Hill, which is Spur 5. And this was done by the South African Light Horse, including Winston Churchill. They came up from below, you'll, you'll see a red arrow. They started off, off the sort of map to the south and came up to where there's a kind of uh, Y shape in my diagram. And that's where the horses were uh, left and the men unsaddled and continued up on foot. Uh, Winston Churchill himself uh, brought up three of the machine guns, which I've marked MG on the map, um, while the main assault was taking place directly up the tip of Bastion Hill. This picture shows Winston Churchill in the South African Light Horse uniform on the right, and on the left, the, the Colt machine guns of their battery. So they uh, were firing at the crest of Bastion Hill while the South African light horse men were scrambling up the steep sides of the hill. Uh, Trooper Tobin was the first on top um, and he gestured with his hat for them to stop firing, but actually there were no Boers on Bastion Hill. They'd already withdrawn to their trench line 1,000 to 2,000 meters further back. So by the evening of the 20th of January, the situation is like this. Tabanyama Plateau has got the Boers on the true crest about 2,000 meters or, or, or less from the British 
who occupy the southern crest or the slopes below it. The next morning, uh, Colonel Walter Kitchener decided to take the initiative and do an attack more or less of his own initiative. He was the younger brother of Herbert Horatio Kitchener, who just landed in South Africa, and I think he was trying to attract attention to himself. It was an absolutely disastrous attack, and as a colonel, he was really only in command of one battalion, but he did an attack with an entire brigade. Basically, he decided to attack across the open plain of Tabanyama to Platkop, or Flat Hill. It's Platkop in Afrikaans means Flat Hill. And the reason he decided to do this is that halfway across the plateau, there's a donga or a, a wadi in which his men could take cover. And while the men of the Queens and the West Yorks were charging forward, they were going to get covering fire from the Lancashire Fusiliers to their right and from um, the East Surreys to their left. And, and four companies of the East Surreys would also try and work their way down in the plateau to take Platkop from the side. The problem was there was no preliminary artillery bombardment possible because the guns on Three Tree Hill couldn't uh, shell Platkop from where they were. Walter Kitchener decided he would do a preliminary bombardment with small arms, something which had never been tried before and was never tried since. This shows the starting point of the attack, the uh, stone wall uh, at where the British were sheltering prior to the attack on Platkop. And this shows the, the British putting down long range fire from a wall just like that in preparation for the rush forward. The Queens brought up their Maxim gun on its wheeled carriage to provide supporting fire as well. And when the firing stopped, then the attack began. This is the attack took place over this terrain. You can see it's at, at the time of the battle, it would have had no trees whatsoever, just grass. But you'll see running down the middle from obliquely across this, the, the terrain, you'll see this deep ditch or donga. This was the, the, the uh, objective which would split the, the, um, the grassy plateau in half in which the men could take shelter. And the Boers were amazed to see people, uh, British soldiers getting up in groups of 25 or 30 and running forward to try and take shelter in the Donga. And, and they would have absolutely no trouble from Platkop, which is the high ground in the distance, shooting him down. This shows uh, what one finds on Platkop today, masses of uh, expended uh, Boer rounds, and there's a clear field of fire all the way to the British line. Within a couple of hours, there'd been a hundred casualties and General Clary had had enough and asked Walter Kitchens to call it off. Uh, many of those who died are buried on the spot as this uh, isolated grave shows. So by the middle of the day on the 21st, the situation had become static. And I'm sure for anyone who is a student of the Great War, you'll start to see the parallels between this campaign and the Western Front. And the two lines stayed exactly like this from the 21st to the 24th of January. And the Battle of Spionkop was done to try and break this stalemate. During this time, the British didn't light cooking fires in the firing line, fear of attracting fire. So you'll find lots of tins and tin openers on the British line. They used their long range volley sites to try and shoot over Tabanyama at the lagers behind. Uh, General Hart said he hoped this, the bullets would fall one and a half to three miles away. And uh, hopefully he, he thought he'd give the Boers something to worry about, but they couldn't see a single Boer. They could hear them, they could hear the mouths of fire, they could see the effect of the mouths of fire whenever they showed themselves. They couldn't see anyone at all. The British then brought up um, howitzers, these are five inch howitzers, to try to uh, destroy the Boer trench line by high explosives. Uh, the Lydite shells created a very impressive crater in the ground, but all the observers said that unless you were standing very, very close to the explosion, you were more or less unharmed by it. So artillery fire uh, didn't seem to have the effect that it was intended. And uh, Berger Schickeling, the man who 
who I showed you the photograph of before, he said that in the jurisdiction of the rifle, uh, artillery does not have the deciding vote. At night, the artillery on both sides would fire star shell. This is magnesium uh, shells, which would light up the battlefield for a few seconds because both sides were terrified of a night attack. But during the day, it was long range fire from both sides, Boer versus British and British versus Boer, with occasional casualties on both sides. So by the 22nd of January, General Warren was uh, urged by General Buller to do something about it, to try and break the stalemate. He could have continued much longer than I think would have got through had he been left alone. But there was now a sense of, of urgency, otherwise Buller threatened to withdraw everybody back across the river. So Warren uh, decided to divide the battlefield into right attack and left attack. The division being this deep ravine running down the middle of Tabanyama, which we now call Battle Sprite. Left attack would be under the command of General Hart. Right attack would be under the, under the command of General Talbot Coke, who just arrived with a new brigade of, uh, of four battalions. And the Boer trench line shown above was most vulnerable on the right at a place called Green Hill. Green Hill sticks out like a thumb from the Boer trench line and can be isolated from it by artillery fire. Not only that, but if the British were to take Spioncorp, they could actually look down onto Green Hill from the, the northern extremity of Spioncorp and could enfilade the Boer trenches. So Green Hill could be brought under converging artillery and rifle fire. And being the weak point, that's where the British attack was going to take its, take, uh, concentrate. But to do that, the British would first have to take Spionkop. Spionkop was not part of the Boer trench line for the simple reason it's impossible to dig trenches on Spionkop. Spionkop is a flat topped mountain and it's flat topped because it's got a, a, a rocky stratum running just under the soil. Leading the attack on Spionkop was going to be Thorncroft's mounted infantry, which you can see in this photograph. Uh, dismounted in their characteristic uh, uniform. And this is just to show that on the day of the Battle of Spionkop, the 24th of January, there was a great deal of troop movement. I'll try and talk you through this. So on the left, you can see the letter W. That's General Woodgate, who was going to lead the assaulting column in the night, 1,700 men. And once they were on Spionkop, they would then move to the northern extremity and fire eastwards onto Green Hill. At the same time, a whole series of troop movements would happen on Spur One. The Devons would move north to Pickett Hill, the East Surreys and the Shropshire Light Infantry would all move north, ready for an attack on Green Hill as soon as those on Spion Corp had brought Green Hill under fire from, from the east. But what happened was, as we know, everything went badly wrong on Spion Corp itself and uh, further um, battalions were sent up to reinforce them. The Imperial Light Infantry, the Middlesex, the Scottish Rifles, all went up to Spionkop itself. Spionkop Summit is the size of Trafalgar Square. So to have um, five in infantry battalions crowded together there was absolutely lethal. Was, uh, another infantry battalion was sent up to Twin Peaks, the King's Royal Rifles on the right, and then three further battalions were sent up in reserve. So by the time Spionkop battle had been gone, been in progress till the afternoon, there was the forces uh, on Tabanyamo were now too weak to make a frontal attack. And their commander, Talbot Koch, was now engaged on Spionkop as well. There was no one to lead the attack. And on green, green parts of the map here, you'll see the counterattack by the Boers. There were only 300 Boers involved in the counterattack on Spionkop summit itself. This shows Spionkop in the middle of the day um, from the south, southeast. And you can see on the right of the picture, the ascent spur that the British climbed up in the night. Then you'll see the summit itself, the flat summit of Spionkop. Then off to the left, you'll see this gentle decline, and then a little pimple of a hill called Conical Hill. Conical Hill dominates the hill to its left, which is Green Hill. 
and it's Conical Hill, which the British should have taken had their trench line been in the right place. The problem is Spiencook doesn't look like that on a misty morning in the summer. It looks like this. It's in a dense cloud on, on a typical summer's morning. And in that dense cloud, it's very difficult to know where you are or what you're doing. In brief, the British dug their trench line in, in, in the wrong place. You can see on this uh, picture taken from an aircraft, the trench about 400 meters uh, across the summit of Spionkop, which had absolutely no possibility of preventing reinforcements from coming up. You'll see the Carolina commander came up from the right and quickly the artillery and Boer fire started to produce disastrous casualties on Spionkop. But my aim isn't to talk about Spionkop itself tonight, because I'd come back and do it on another night if, if you'd like. But to, I really wanted to show you the campaign in which this disastrous day took place. Some of the officers on Spionkop did have cameras with them. This is uh, Lieutenant Northey of the Scottish Rifles taking photograph as his men rest just below the summit. We know there was at least one other officer with a camera, but that camera has never turned, those pictures have never turned up of the battle itself. The next day, our friend Jan Huppen came up to Spionkop with his camera and did those famous propaganda pictures which have put this battle in everybody's imagination. And this shows the exact same scene today. The trench in the foreground is now a communal grave and the trench in the background which is the trench in which the Lancashire Fusiliers surrendered, has been completely removed. The stones have been used to make the grave in the foreground. After the Battle of Spionkop, the firing con continued unabated for a further two days, and on the 26th of January, the men began to withdraw across the Tugela, and by the 27th of January, they had withdrawn entirely. The Boers were far too exhausted to follow them up or to try and inhibit their, their retreat. And the day of the 26th of January, it rained incessantly all day, so there was no, no possibility of them seeing what was happening. So the withdrawal was done very, very bloodlessly. Today, the battlefield is a very tranquil place. On the left, you can see Bastion Hill in the background with stretcher bearers taking the wounded from the field hospital to the ambulance wagons. And this is the same scene today. The field hospital grounds on our uh, Rangeworthy Military Cemetery. And to end with, this is a picture of Spionkop in the evening, uh, a place of tremendous atmosphere and, and beauty. And um, I hope I haven't gone on too long, and I'm very happy to take questions. I apologize if I've exceeded my time. Dudley? Coming. <laughs> Good. Oh, well, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, Simon in the comments in the chat box, I think has signed, uh, has summed it up. He said, brilliant employment of photos and maps to illustrate your talk exemplary. Uh, and I'd like to echo that. Um, I, I was fascinated from start to finish um, we will take questions and I, I would encourage people to, to put questions into the chat box now, but I am conscious that um, we all have busy lives and I know that uh, eventually people will start to drift away, but Robert's happy to take questions for as long as you want to, uh, to post them. And um, before we start, I just want to say this is why I'm a member of the society. Um, of army historical research i'm my my wars are the wars of the 20th century um but i am fascinated by uh, the british and commonwealth experience uh, prior to that uh, and you get exposed to all sorts of knowledge research uh, and people who really know their stuff uh, in the in the society and behind me you can see the journals which uh, are published quarterly uh, and um, uh, well worth your subscription so i would encourage you if you're not a member of the society to, to think about joining us well that's that's oh i've got to say that's enough by way of publicity but uh, when you do eventually leave uh, the talk this evening 
you will be directed to the registration page for next month's talk, which will be given by Carol Duval uh, on the 30th of May. Uh, and uh, we would encourage you to register for that. So, Robert, the first question comes from Amelia, and she's asked, what was the British casualty rate at Upper Tagema uh, and for the British and for the Bulls? Um, well, the Lancashire Fusiliers lost a third of their strength, um, and they were the worst affected because of their losses on Spion Corps. Um, the other British units lost between 20 and 25 percent of their strength in that 10 day period. The Boers had 58 uh, killed on the Upper Tagela, 25 of them on Spion Corp itself. Um, Boer wounded are not, uh, are not re reliably recorded. So I can say that Boer, Boer losses were about one tenth of the British losses, but their strength was also about one tenth of the British strength. Thank you. Um, Simon has asked, what lessons did the British take from this action, both in the short and the long term? Well, you can see this is the sort of um, kindergarten of trench warfare. I think the difference between this and the Western Front on the, in the Great War is that this, these trench lines were widely separated, a very long range war, whereas in the Great War there were probably 200 meters rather than 2,000. Um, so the British became very familiar with the idea of trench warfare and, and, and on preliminary bombardments and, and I think the, the essence of how you get people out of a trench became the main problem of the Great War. Shrapnel didn't do it, and high explosive only did it if you gave a direct hit. So it's very, very difficult. Um, the other thing, the British became obsessed with the fact that Boers <laughs> had a better rifle. And in, 19, in 2000, sorry, 1913, they came up with a rifle called the P-13, which basically was a Mauser. It was a Mauser caliber, Mauser action, Mauser stock, Mauser. But thank God, it never went into widespread production. It became, the P-13 became the P-14, but it, Thank goodness it did not replace the Lee Enfield, which actually, when they shortened it and made it into the short magazine Lee Enfield, became the best battle rifle ever made. Um, it, this pinpoint accuracy the Boers had was much less of an issue than reliability and the fact that it wouldn't jam in, in muddy conditions. Um, I, I'll add a question now. Do you find during your research that your experience as a doctor helped you understand the nature of the inju injuries that you explained to us this evening? Yes, I've got, a, uh, I've got an interest in that. And remember, the, there was an enormous uh, publication of articles in the Lancet and British Medical Journal. Every week there'd be an article from South Africa of the wounds and then the ratio of killed to wounded and so on. And after the war, there were books and books written about these new weapons and the new wounds they pro they produced. They were they were regarded as humane uh, weapons. Um, merciful mouths, as they called it. It was, a, it was a lot of fascination. And the other thing you'll find when reading the medical reports in these journals is that they don't anonymize them. They'll give you the name of the patient and describe their wounds and their outcome and so on. Quite different to today. They're much more frank than we are today. Thank you. Um, Catherine's asked, is it true that both sides retreated overnight at Spee and Cop? No, not, not entirely. Remember, the Boers were up and down all the time to uh, get ammunition or to drink or to eat or to have a rest. So they left um, sentries uh, on the slopes of the mountain throughout the night. And during the night, they went back up repeatedly. So it, the idea that the mountain was abandoned by both sides and and they were baffled and the Boers just reoccupied it quicker is, a, is, a, is an oversimplification. But no, the Boers, Louis Borton knew the British would leave and was waiting for it and had plans for the uh, counterattack the next morning. It was uh, far, far less of a sort of strange coincidence than, than we're told. There's lots of oversimplification um, by latter-day historians. Um, you mentioned during the talk that um, the British were terif terrified, not the right word, but worried about um, ball night attacks. But yes. 
there is no evidence at the moment in your talk about night night fighting. Does that does that happen during the war? Yes, I mean, I think by the end of the war, it was quite a regular tactic was to attack in the dark, uh, often just before dawn. Um, but the, the experience at Marcus Fontaine, when the Highland Brigade had attacked in the night and had, had walked onto a Boer trench and been slaughtered, I think terrified them. And they, of course, if you don't have a map, look, even with a map, it's very easy to get lost in those hills. Without a map, it's absolute certainty that you'll get lost. Um, so the, the, the British had two fears. The one was a night attack and the other one was being cut off. They didn't know where the Boers were. They couldn't see them. They didn't know the strength. They always overestimated the strength. And they were terrified that if they stretched their line of communication too long in any direction, they would be cut off. That seemed to be the, the certain way to lose a battle was to get cut off. And there were many examples of this. So those were the two fears, night attacks and being cut off. Um, Roberts asked, how long after Spear and Cop before Lady Smith was relieved? About five weeks. Lady Smith was relieved on the 28th of February. Spear and Cop was the 24th of January. And uh, Mark, I, I hope I pronounced your uh, name correctly. Um, what were the artillery pieces used in that period and on that battle? Well, the sort of backbone of British artillery was the 15-pounder shrapnel uh, gun. Uh, it was deployed in batteries of six. It was always within sight of the target, which means that the target was within sight of the battery. Um, and it only fired shrapnel. It couldn't fire a uh, common shell or star shell. And the other type of our artillery was the five-inch howitzer, which could fire a uh, common shell, that's lidite, or star shell, but couldn't fire shrapnel. Um, on, the, on the Boer side, there were German guns made by Krupp, 75 millimeter Krupp, and there were 75 millimeter cruiser, French guns as well. Very accurate, uh, much longer range, and as I've said before, always firing from concealed positions uh, where they were never seen by, by the British. So quite, quite a different uh, strategy in, in the use of artillery. Um, thank you. Uh, that, uh, we allow sort of roughly 75 minutes for our lecture and our questions, and that's, that's you run exactly to time, Robert, so that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I have one last question myself. Is I, I know that you are sort of a small arms enthusiast of the weapons of that period. Um, yes. what, what's your experience of firing the Mauser? Here. They're an extremely good rifle. They've got very good sights, very fine sights. Um, my club, we do a, a competition each year called the Siege of Ladysmith, and the Mauser always beats the Lee Enfield every year in terms of um, accuracy and, and speed of fire. So it's a very, very good rifle. Um, I've, I've, I've shoot mine up to 1,000 meters, um, but I'm much happier at 100 and 200 meters. Um, no, very, very good rifle. But I, I must say, when, when Pretoria fell and the Boers could no longer rely on ammunition, they switched to captured 303s. And I have yet to come across any criticism in any Boer mem memoir or letter of the British rifle. They thought they were absolutely superb, and they are superb. The Lee Enfield is a very, very good rifle. It's perhaps slightly cruder in the sights, but that's the only, only objection I'd have about it. Well, thank you. Um, if you ha if you care to open your chat box, you'll see that there's a fantastic reception this evening. Um, really some nice comments. People have really enjoyed the talk, Robert. And um, thank you once again for sharing your your knowledge of the of the battlefield. It's on my bucket list. South Africa is where I want to go. I want to visit these battlefields, and I'm the land, the land. That's very kind of you. Okay. You. Um, everybody, we're, we're going to close now. Um, as I said at the beginning, we will get a copy of the recording out to you uh, automatically this evening. And um, please spread the word. Um, these talks are becoming more and more popular, uh, and it's a way for us to promote the society. Uh, and, I, and I think you you all agree that we are getting a, a, quite a spread of interesting talks. 
And Carol's talk uh, next month on Abercrombie, the can-do general, uh, I'm looking forward to as well. So um, from Robert and myself, thank you very much indeed, and, and good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much.